Hey, Ben. Hey, Brandon. I thought I was on the wrong link for some reason. <laughs> no, I just... Uh takes a little bit on mondays for me like oh yeah i gotta log into the lf thing so it'll redirect me and blah 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 blah. and i was yeah i don't mike said he's feeling a little run down from open source yeah. summit, so i don't know if he'll join today yeah he messaged me about this as well okay Hello. Give me a hand. Hey, how's it going? Hey, me. Hi. Hey, Jeff. Hey, good morning. Hi, hey, Perth. Hello. I feel hey, Perth, did you get a haircut? Yep, got a haircut. <laughs> nice. Got to look, got to look good for tomorrow's thing, right? That was the only yeah. reason. <laughs> no, I was maybe was... why I got maybe why I got my hair cut on Friday too. <laughs> no. I think I'm no, was, the was... event. No, I mean my I mean this is kidding. I was like I my hair was getting all like, out of control. So it was time to get my hair cut anyways. I was just procrastinating. <laughs> I guess I'll okay, give well, the event tomorrow with uh, the CNCF. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Should we go ahead and get started or do we know if there's somebody else on the way in? I think we should pretty good. No, let's not go. Cool. Yeah, I do can get started. I can kick us off. Um, this meeting is being recorded. This is the cloud maintenance call. It'll be made available online 
um, participation. The call is in her inherent to the code of conduct for the North Foundation of the NSSF, as well as antitrust policies. More details on the Open SSF uh, site and GitHub repositories. Um, looking through today's agenda, um, new friends now looks like all familiar faces. Um, looks like we have a couple of topics. Um, some from Ben uh, around docs, um, the demos as well as the documentation demos as well as I added a little bit to talk about the um, kind of, I was curious about the status of the other GraphQL backends. Um, and then any anything else people want to talk about? If not, I think once we go through that, we can look through the open, open, uh, open items. Mm -hmm. Cool, um, Ben. I think you you up first. Yeah. Um. So the first one is just more of a visibility thing. Um. I opened an issue to be promoted to reviewer to docs. Uh, but one thing that occurred to me as I was opening that is we didn't explicitly include Guac, the Guac data repo um, as part of the docs area when that was created. So I kind of wanted to get a, a sense from everyone of whether or not it should be. I tend to think that it should. It's because it's basically used for the demo examples in the docs. Um, but I didn't want to just sort of, you know, decide that unilaterally. Um, but I... Uh, put the demo scripts from last week's community call into that guac data repo because that seemed like the best home for it. Um, and I think Mihai uh, merged that pull request earlier. So they're kind of related there. But I think that makes sense. I agree. Um, so are, are you saying it's... So part of it is documenting that change and also um, is the handling of permissions also, do you think that process has to be changed as well? Is it, uh, what's your review of how we've done permissions? <laughs> I think it's done, been done pretty well. Um, you know, I think it's just, you know, and, you know, in full, full transparency, um, I was granted access to the docs repo already. I just wanted to open this issue as, you know, kind of formalize uh, and document that, you know, everyone's on board with it. Um, okay. But yeah, I think, you know, our our approach has been pretty good so far. Just, I just got to find more people to move up the ladder. Um, I plus one this, this sounds good to me, thanks Ben. And the other thing I opened is again, it's just uh, you know a visibility thing. I reworked some of the demo flow just to kind of um, simplify things a little bit. And a lot of it's just kind of moving the distractions to the bottom of the page and things like that. Um, so just more of a you know, please review it as opposed to any. I don't think it needs discussion right now unless there's anything serious. Cool, sounds good. Um, go put this on the review list. Cool. Um, the next item I added, I was kind of curious a little bit about um, and the guy why is using the Arango backend. Um, what's I guess like I'm kind of curious of are there any other backends besides the the um 
Lionel so, with Arango, we had the near like, kind of the cipher one also. Um uh, yeah, I was wondering like who's using them, like what's the experience? Um yeah, so for the uh guide wire it has having issues with Arango. One because I think they're you know, I think they're doing this like they're trying to, you know, do this part time, but like they're trying to put all the pieces together, and they're very far behind. They're like they're they're on like version four, I think, is zero dot four, and because we're you know we're not maintaining it at this point, I think they're like okay now they're kind of lost. Like hey, what do I do? Kind of thing. Like so, I told them I was like, and on top of that, they want to use this as an open source type of tool, and you know if they're going to use this in production, yeah, if they're going to use this in production. I was like, I told them multiple times, I was like, you guys, if you're going to use this for any kind of production data or anything, you can't do this. You realize that, right? Like, you have to pay Arango at the end of the day. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, like I told them multiple times, and then finally, during the last, like, I had a call with them, um, and they're like, yeah, the, uh, you know, the. We're still having issues with the database. We upgraded all the way to zero, you know, zero seven, I think, at the time. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm sure you're gonna have you're having issues. But I was like, you know, we're not maintaining our angle at the end of the day. And also for your use case, you really can't use it. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know why you're still sticking with it. Like just if you switch over to Postgres and end, you know, we can support you. Any issues you find, we can we can fix or or we already have fixed. Um, and if you know, we can both be, you know mutually beneficial because if you find issues and you know helps everybody out the whole community i like to switch over to that so i think they're finally like yeah like yeah yeah i think we're they're migrating over to postgres now um and i told and then uh, i think they're they're still kind of like building their pieces you know their different pieces out but i think they're just having um you know I, but they're one of the things one of the things they're asking about is like uh, there was no guide really like a demo or some kind of a guide about how to run this as like a production type thing you know like with guac collect guac ingest um guac, uh, all those kind of pieces all tied together you know we have the helm chart uh we have the docker compose but there's no like write-up of like how this should actually be run in like a production type environment i was like yeah i agree that that's not there the helm chart is probably the helm chart and maybe the docker compose is the closest things we have about how it should be run uh, but there's no like, you know, like how, you know, we, oh yeah, Nats is running. We have, uh, uh, you know, we have the, the queue running in the background kind of, I mean, and that's, and then the blob store, I mean, like all those kind of different pieces, how they're supposed to kind of interact with each other and what they're kind of buying you and, you know, how, how the certifiers are constantly running in the background to give you more updated information. Like all that kind of stuff is not recorded anywhere. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, we understand that all, but I think the rest of the users don't understand how this should be run in a production type demo, you know, demo environment is fine, but like, a, how do I run this actually as a production type thing? That's, that's the thing that they were asking about that we don't have. Does it make sense? Um, like, you know, if, if folks sat down with them for, um, a couple of hours in, in exchange for them writing that up, um, because also at the same time, I don't want like, with our already limited amount of time on all the different things, I don't want it to just be like, hey, we're essentially doing the work of a set of consultants who could figure this out and build this for them rather than, you know, um, you know, like obviously we want to make sure that this thing sort of runs, but the same way that like if you look at Kubernetes, right, there are a couple of things out there about running Kubernetes in production, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of folks is just like, yeah, no, they, you know, we hire a consultant to to handle that sort of thing or we read any of the books or whatever. Um, Cause I just want to make sure that like at the same time, it's like, Hey, we can't do all the work for, for them either. Yeah. Um, and, and to be clear, I'm not saying that they're asking for that per se. It's just, Hey, look, like, you know, the project is, is, is what it is. And so we need to be able to kind of come together to figure that out. And I, I think that might also be better because we may skip things that might be obvious to us <laughs> or so someone coming in new be like, okay, I should probably write this thing down because I fell into this, you know, this trap or something. I mean, yeah, uh, that is something you can, you know, I can next time I chat with them or something or, or over Slack or something, you can ask them to do like, Hey, if you guys are interested in writing up, writing up a production type instance, I can sit down, you know, we can sit down with them. I would say like, yeah. I would say like an hour is enough. To kind of cover it, I would. I don't think even an hour might. It might not take that long, but 
I, I yeah, it is the production stuff is a little bit tricky because I like, uh, it's also dependent on the environment they run with the club provided that they do and look like that, which is like yeah. 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 So I, I mean, I would say production with you know Nats and maybe yeah, I mean like the Blob Store. You you choose what Blob Store you want to use, yeah. right? Like, again, that's cloud specific. Yeah. So I, maybe I we write it up and yeah. Sorry, go. Ahead. So, sorry, just quickly. I I would say like uh, I I feel like these are uh, nice as blog posts, um, because I find that these get stale very quickly, <laughs> um. So I I I'm in favor of like a blog post style. Um, I I I think a few details could, we can probably put a little bit more details in the documentation. But I think like it's a whole like how do you run this in production thing. I I, I think that that would drift fairly quickly. Yeah. yeah think, um, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Mike. Oh, so so uh, I was just gonna say yeah. No, I I agree. Um, you know, I think it's also okay to have like a. You know, if they wanted to have like even an example repo or whatever, and we just say, hey, look, you know, this is run by the community. And so not necessarily always up to date. Um, I think that's that's fine. But I do think that, you know, at the end of the day, it's like. If let's say, you know, like if we're going to ask them to help participate here, I think we also want to make sure that they are uh, whatever they want to use and that they think is, you know, I'm okay with them saying, "Hey, this is how we use it, you know, for us, and this is what we're what we're doing." Obviously, with us sitting down with them, working with them, whatever, um, uh, on on that end. Um, and then the other thing, which I will put a pin in for later, is also a few other folks at OSSEU had sort of said similar things of, "Hey, we took a look at Guac. We found certain things kind of difficult to run with with Guac. So um, if if there was more of this, they might be more inclined to to adopt Guac, um, but we can put a pin in that until later. Uh, yeah, so I'll go. So, um, I think. Sorry, I just wanted to get oh, yeah. get a clarification from from Michael. Um, is it folks trying to like run Guac as a as a broad service, or is this just like running it? Um, it's a little of both. It's a little bit of uh, running the, the demo is difficult, which makes the further exacerbation of running the, like, oh my gosh, if it's this amount of work just to get it up and running in dev, what's the sort of work that it's going to be actually running this um, in, in a more production-like environment? Sorry, Jeff. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you know, on the docs right now, the setup, we only have the demo setup. So we used to have uh, a setup using like a full compose with ingester, separate ingesters and NATs. And we took that out to try to make the demo simpler, the whole deployment. Um, so that hasn't been replaced with like a uh, full compose guide. Um, so I think that that is something that we should have, um, even if it's not, uh, sup if, if, it shouldn't be like everything you need to know to run block in production, but we should have a, um, doc page for deploying guac with the full deployment, uh, using the compose cause the compose files are in the repo and we maintain those. Um, and then separately, I think from there, what we should have is, um, the Guac components page, or we should have something like that or something more filled out with like a description of what each binary does. Um, and I think like having here, just click this Docker up, uh, you know, compose up. And also here's a description of the binaries. Like that should be as far as our project goes for saying like, this is how you run it in production. Because essentially like we can't have like a whole class on how to run services at production, right? Um, the last thing we could consider is a guide for starting up the Helm chart. But again, it should really just be like, here's your cluster, run the, you know, Helm commands. And then you're, you know, here's some variables that like you need to provide and that's it. 
Um, but then that from that point on, they can explore the Helm chart on their own. Um, so I kind of see us having deficiencies in those spots as far as like we should have the project uh, provide that. Yeah, I agree with everything Jeff just said. Um, I think, you know, having a list of like, here's the considerations for running in prod, like, you know, this collector at, you know, typical usage needs like this kind of resources or something is, you know, probably useful guidance to people. But yeah, we don't want to be in the business of describing how to run services in production Um unless there are like weird, like specific to guac, you know, things that people need to think about when they're, you know, configuring or deploying. So one of the, the things I was thinking as, as, um, as we're talking about the 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 backends, and now we're saying like you know around uh, since Skywire is moving away from Rango, I don't know whether anyone's using the Opus Cipher one. Um, this may be a hot take, but I'm kind of thinking like should we nuke them, and like I, and and even more opinionated to be like we're gonna support one backend um postgres seems not that offensive <laughs> um, um and yeah and try and uh, until we 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 develop more and like like get more concrete uh and more mature then we can start thinking about supporting more backends yeah, I uh so I agree. I think based on and again, a lot of this is like partially my speculation based on conversations, but a lot of folks had sort of said they felt that like some of the stuff in Guac was a little too complicated because they weren't sure like should I be using a Rango? Should I be using the key value? Should I be it's like and I know that we we have a lot of the stuff in the docs, but I feel like if things were just more sim simpler and straightforward, I think folks would 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 feel a little bit more comfortable with like, you know, um, if I take a step back, I think one of the challenges is if somebody hears about Guac and they look at Guac, they should within 30 seconds know what Guac does and at least be able to know how to get started with Guac. And if I look at like the other tools out there, you know, there's like a very clear like, oh, you download this and run, run, you know, foo quick start or run foo uh, startup or whatever it is, and they're already getting getting running here. Um, I think if we just sort of said, yep, here's, you know, here's the one option, it's Postgres, kind of, you know, move forward with it. Um, and, you know, there, there was stuff there, I think folks would, would be a bit more um, receptive to it. And I think in addition to that, which is again, slightly tangential, but I think the same thing kind of goes with, um, like if folks said, oh, okay, I use the REST API to answer these sorts of questions. Great. Oh, I have a more complicated query. Here's what the G, you know, here's what the uh, GraphQL looks like for, for doing that more complicated sort of query. I think then that like that tells the story of somebody sitting down, they're like, I I have all these S bombs and salsa and whatever else. I want to start answering questions. Oh my gosh, if I do this, this, and this, I can start answering those questions. Uh, me. Yeah, I'm thinking the same. So we should have like the common API, like this is the backend that you use. These are the options that you use. You can query the common data with the uh, REST API. And then if you need options to configure, you can either configure them in some uh, YAML file or whatever for deployment or more API checks, more API lines of code to configure the other backends. And then we can display warnings like this backend is only supported there and so on. But that would be like under an advanced section on the site or something like that. Yeah, I almost want to say maybe like uh, the GraphQL should be like the the advanced the advanced block developer flag. <laughs> you you only yeah. enable that here. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think now that more folks are using S bomb salsa, etc., we have a lot more um, actual folks to talk to who now know what they're looking for compared to, you know, even just a few months ago. Um, uh, which is, um, and I, again, this is just based on, again, like, you know, I talked to Bloomberg, for example, at, at OSS EU, um, and some other folks. And I think now that they understand like, oh, I have these S bombs and I want to do these things with these S bombs, as opposed to, I have these S bombs, what do I do with them? Um, I think that's coming together a bit more and the sorts of things that are coming together, which I think are, we're, you know, positioned really well to do this is, Hey, the number one things are around, like. I have questions about the licenses in my supply chain and I have questions about the vulnerabilities in my supply chain. And they're mostly the same sorts of things that I think everybody would have, which is like, yeah, what are the, you know, um, what, uh, what dependency or rather what uh, projects are in my supply chain that, you know, have a lot of vulnerabilities and that I should be taking a look at. And can you just tell me that by just saying like, yeah, like, list of vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities, and here's the projects impacted, or, hey, here's a project, list me the vulnerabilities that are, are in that project. I think those are, you know, and the same thing goes with like license stuff of, oh my gosh, we're all using um, something that changed its license. Uh, you know, how many of my projects are impacted that we now need to figure out how to remove something like, let's say, Arango, right, from our, our uh, uh, you know, using Arango. It's like, oh, okay, these are all the projects we need to to change. Um, and then I think the thing there is, again, like that's sort of the basic set of questions. And then the other set of questions is stuff like um, uh, uh, whatever else, um, you know what I mean? Uh, the, 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 the can go to the GraphQL. Um, one thing also that uh, before I, I forget, just because it's the one other thing that I remember really vividly from OSS EU is two other separate people had said, for the REST API, if there was a way to register queries, like can I can up a GraphQL query and just say, here are some parameters for that GraphQL query and it would just run it. So you'd be able to say, hey, uh, somebody writes the the more you know complicated GraphQL query, they register it with the REST API. Um, and so that they could always go back to it. So it's like, hey, I spent, you know, somebody spent an hour figuring out this GraphQL query they ran it and now it's like, oh, somebody else is asking to use the same one. They want to be able to, let's say, register it so they could just sort of run that GraphQL query as if it was like a REST endpoint. So something like slash saved queries, slash, you know, uh, ID or whatever, or, or whatever the name is. Uh, like two separate people had sort of asked for that at OSS EU because they're like, hey, here's this GraphQL stuff. I just don't know, like, like we want to be able to just sort of hit this as some sort of, um, so I don't have to like distribute a, a script or whatever. And I was like, all right, I'll pass it along. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> I mean, like if you know GraphQL, like it's you can create files with named queries and parameters and then like execute those using any kind of library or... Well, I think that the, the answer that, yeah, I think the answer is how do you get that as part of something that mm -hmm. somebody doesn't have to download a bunch of stuff regarding GraphQL or whatever and run the scripts themselves? You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a little bit of a different opinion also. I, I, I think, um, I think if they're looking for something specific like that, then I want to say for the most part, we should support it because one day we're going to change <laughs> details of the GraphQL thing that, you know, we're not sure if anyone's using it. <laughs> it's going to break. Um, yeah. I, I I think like having REST APIs uh, like pluggable so at least we know like Future considerations of changing the GraphQL API or like database indexes, like we know that we're not breaking any users. I think that yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, for or queries they'll, they'll want to use in, um, say in production or, or regularly or consistently, um, because the other option here. The other option there is to go and contribute to to Guac um, or 
um, and upstream the changes um, or fave a fork, make them there. Um, and, and this seems like a an easier way to do that. But I I, I see Jeff's point as well in um, how it doesn't make that much sense to me, I guess, um, for this to be just sort of for experimentation. Um, like if you running, you can run a query against, um, the, you can send a query to the GraphQL endpoint and you can just, that person could just, I don't know, send you a query and then you just run it. Yeah, I think the, I th and maybe this is just like, maybe the answer is, is, is something just completely separate from this. But I think the, the thing that folks were bringing up was just the interaction with a REST API is a much more known quantity than the interaction with a GraphQL API. So that's not to say that like folks wouldn't want to, you know, it, it seemed less about the GraphQL and more about the interaction with the GraphQL API. So I do wonder if it's, if, you know, I, I GraphQL querying is not the easiest thing to wrap your head around, right? I mean, it has some missing things like, you know, I mean, we haven't implemented them, like not include, not including, for example, like, hey, don't not basically, right? Not this thing, not that thing. We don't do that at all, which makes it a lot harder for a lot of things. Um, you know, we have things like like and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I know there was a, at one point we were discussing this, like, does it make sense to, uh, at the REST API endpoint, expose out the actual ent Postgres kind of thing um, so that you can do more advanced queries if you need to and bypass GraphQL, right? Then you're not gonna, you're not restricted by GraphQL anymore and you can do whatever you want to the database to retrieve the information you want in the most effective manner. Because if you're sticking to the GraphQL, right, you are restricted by the different types and the data types and whatever endpoints that we have for it. So. It, it maybe that's a better route to go down. But. Having the GraphQL run, can, I'm sorry, having the REST API run canned GraphQL queries doesn't sh doesn't insulate you from the ontology at all because the return results would be exactly the GraphQL nodes, which is exactly what people are not happy with, right? Like they're saying, oh, the REST API is so easy. I hit an endpoint. I get an object that has like a name, namespace type version field, and I, I can understand that, but they're not going to get that if we just give them the results. They're going to get the nested nodes, for example. I I, I think that that kind of attraction, yeah, I think that that seems to it's, it sounds like that's what they want, right? They normally just want like, oh, here's a wrapper on GraphQL, yeah, oh, but here's a wrapper, and I specifically want to deliver this information out of that thing, uh, and run a reject. Um, uh, back to kind of what Cloud was saying, I, I I actually really like that a lot, uh, in terms of, and I think that was one of the motivations, that, you know, if we if we drop kind of the rest of the the, the back ends that we know we, we don't no longer maintain that could be one way to kind of make iteration faster as well, right? So I think essentially um saying like yeah GraphQL is something that you should only use if you're developing or like prototyping things. Uh then that keeps it on the same the same level of stability as like the schema itself and then you know you know that opens up folks to I think SQL seems to be something that that, that most people are familiar with and uh, and uh like you know program managers and product managers can can you know iterate and prototype with SQL as well. I think that could be an interesting opportunity too. So um yeah, so I agree actually with, with what Jeff said as, as well there, which is um, I think the, the key bit of it, which was like, I think diving into what folks were saying, they were asking for more of what Jeff is saying. I want to not be exposed to this complicated set of things. Um, 
now I think that there is a, a, a question, right? Which is like, should we allow folks to query the database directly? I think that there's obviously that comes with its own set of concerns, right? Because um, how do you sort of, you know, like you're now making what is something internal to, to graph, to, to, sorry, to guac uh, and you're exposing it out, outside. Um, so I think, you know, uh, th th there are some questions there, but I think, again, I think if you were to say that, like, that's a little bit more um, of a known quantity. Um, one other thing I think that's probably worthwhile, and I know he's not here today, but I met Alistair at, um, uh, in Europe, and he had a lot of interesting thoughts because he's like, hey, I've been playing around with guac, and he's he did say that, like, um, there are certain challenges. And again, I'm not saying we throw out Ent and, and GraphQL or anything like that. But he did say that there were certain challenges with how those things are currently set up, which could be impacting certain things like um, performance and some of the other stuff as well. Um, and And so... Uh, again, th that's kind of where I think like most folks, again, are, I think going to want just the, like something like rest and they just want to be able to ask a very simple question. Um, and then the deeper API, whether it is GraphQL or query the SQL directly, or, um, you know, here is some deeper RPC kind of API. I think, um, we can spend some time thinking about what that actually is. I think obviously for now it's going to be the GraphQL. Um, but I do think that like um, enough folks have been asking for something that is just like, hey, what? Uh, there's probably five or six questions people are going to ask from Guac mostly. <laughs> uh, and can we just make those five or six questions as easy, easy as humanly possible to, to, to ask? Um, yeah. And also, I think we should talk to Alistair more about like what are some of the issues he saw with Ent and what are some of the issues he saw with GraphQL. Um, again, I don't want to go and be like, let's move over to another thing because everything has its own challenges. Um, but I, I do, I, I, I'm personally a little annoyed at like some of the stuff that we were sold with GraphQL based on like people saying like, oh yeah, you're gonna have auth over here, you're gonna have this over there, and then when we actually talk to people, like, oh yeah, that's still gonna be maybe another few years away, and you're like. I thought those was six months away. And it turns out like stuff like auth and some of these other things are just not there. And uh, yeah, anyway, that's my rant. Yeah, on that note, um, I, I mean, this I was- This meeting is being recorded. Sorry. Um, um, I, I wasn't here when GraphQL was developed, but I think it was made under, um, like it, it served a set of use cases. Um, and uh, as this discussion is, that we had as to um, stop supporting any of the other backends, um, one of the use cases for GraphQL was just um, like specifically, um, it was good because the Guac hadn't decided on a, spe on a specific backend and we wanted that flexibility. Um, and that use case doesn't exist anymore, it seems. Yeah, just add, add a little bit extra color. So I think one of the things that initially we were looking at all graph databases and graph databases didn't have a good good interface. Like everyone is using a different graph query language anyway. So GraphQL became a little bit more enticing because you know, we would have to end up having like, oh, open cipher here and like Arango Arango had its own query language as well. Then I kind of, kind of coming back to that, you know, querying SQL directly. Then, right? We, I think GraphQL having the structure there, you know, for in order to ingest all the data properly, I think that's still worthwhile. I don't think we change that, but I think just querying the information out of the database is where GraphQL is now limiting us. Um, because I think ingestion works well. I think you know, I think that's GraphQL. Oh, you know, allows us that structure and everyone kind of follows that. So we're, we're ensuring that nothing, you know, nothing comes in the database that's unexpected or in the, you know, in the manner it's supposed to come in. But then getting the information back out, we're limited a lot by GraphQL. So if we can make, I think, I think if we can solve that issue, I think a lot of people will be like, oh, because SQL is widely known. Like, I think a lot of people, like SQL is not something that like, 
people don't know or Postgres or anything like that, right? And and it's basically this wrapper on top of all this stuff. So it is end of the day still SQL up behind the scenes. So you could go in and query some of this information like you normally would with a SQL query and get the information out. You can do some more recursive things behind the scenes if you needed to, right? Like it could, you can make a lot more effective, efficient queries. If uh, and then that may also make the REST API development a lot easier and a lot quicker, right? For people to go implement it because now they don't have to think about GraphQL anymore. So, uh, just I think there. that I think that still is a like quite a quite a big factor that we shouldn't look over of um exposing like having a separation between the internal uh, implementation details of um of the data and the ontology um, on top of it, um, especially with all the, with the discussions, I guess, uh, that we've been having on um, representing software identifiers differently. Um, and I, I don't know, I think, I think it'd be pretty risky to, to move completely to the, um, to, to a model where like anybody um, that's not, doesn't have a great understanding of Guac should be querying directly the the back end uh the back end data store. Um and so I, I do think it is important to have something on top of that. Um and and as Mike said, I, it seems that most people are just like the common use case is gonna be a set of questions, um nothing too complex. Um that can be added to the to the REST API. I definitely understand that it's difficult to use GraphQL for just in, consumers, but I don't think it's unreasonable to to for a developer, somebody who's developing on Guac, or somebody who's setting up Guac for their uh, for their company to 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 develop a baseline knowledge of, of GraphQL to be able to query it, say. I don't think that's unreasonable. And like that that would allow just the this REST endpoint uh, method to work. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. I agree with the fact that if you can add this into the REST API, abstract, whether it's GraphQL or or you know SQL, whatever it is. At the end of the day, it still needs to return in an return in something. You know the API should handle whatever it needs to and return something that's human readable, easily consumable by, by the user. Right? It doesn't have to. You know, it doesn't have to be and, and in the format that adheres to the you know our ontology and so forth. Right? So like how how everything's going to combine together. So yeah, that, I mean that that's that uh, that is a challenge that people would have to wrap their heads around still of how the data should be represented in the ontology point of view, because by itself, some of the data won't make sense, right? If you query directly from the database, it's like, okay, like, yeah, it's not going to give you, if you don't know what's happening, then it's not really giving you much information back. So, um, I don't want to go down down this rabbit hole. I feel like something maybe we should we should chat about in a future sort of design session is does it make sense to expose the ontology a bit more via the REST API? Um, probably not. I, yeah, I, I don't think so. No. Um, so, do we want to then just like, I, I guess I, so one of the questions that, that is popping into my head a little bit is, um, cause I agree about like, Hey, if, if folks need to dive in, it's not too much to ask them about GraphQL. I think the GraphQL thing is also, there's other things that potentially exacerbate it. Um, that's part of it is the end and just sort of general GraphQL sort of stuff, which is like, we've added some complexity on top of what, what we've, we've built via, um, you know, using GraphQL, which again, not saying that's a bad thing, but as an example, Alistair's like, hey, you would get so much more performance just using normal SQL. Again, that might be okay for our use case, right? We might say, 
that's fine. But like some of the things that he was saying is like you you're not going to run into that whatever it is sixty five hundred parameter thing um, uh, if you were to just run a, a normal um, query. But with that said, right? Um, I'm curious, and this is I think a question for Ben is if we start working with some community members. How much do they even need an expert API? I'm I'm just curious because like maybe the answer is still yes, we use GraphQL, but so few folks are really using it that we don't really need to worry too much about it. And we spend significantly more effort on the REST API and yada yada. Or is the thing is like, oh no, 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 everybody's, you know, yeah, they, they, sure, a lot of the queries are here, but they're demanding, you know, some of these expert level query, you know, the ability to run these expert level queries. I don't know. Um, and so I think some of those are probably good questions for Guidewire and some of the other folks who are kind of coming in is how much, uh, how much effort should we put into that expert API? Well, I think part of it too is we have to get people using the, you know, beginner level API or the lever even ask about an expert level API. So I think, you know, if we can put some effort into, you know, the rest API or whatever sort of, you know, here's the sort of 10 questions that everyone will ask and get that, you know, really solid and reliable for people. And then they come to us and say, well, you know, I've got this really complicated expert level, you know, magical query I want to run and I'm struggling to do it. Then, okay, then we can kind of put effort into enabling those kinds of things. But I don't think we're going to have people jumping directly from, I've never used Guac to, I demand answers to these very complicated questions. I guess, yeah, I think you're fine. I think just like getting people to understand that, um, I want also. I also am curious, kind of like, with the how well people understand the data that's coming in, um, and like the the ontology is overwhelming, right? And I, I don't know whether like what's a good way for for people to to communicate what they want. Maybe maybe they kind of. Mm, know what they want but they don't know how to express it uh, and maybe it's just a, a communication uh, every time Um, I think that the, was a very good discussion. I, I feel like we have a couple potential follow-ups from, from what we just talked about, right? One of it is, um, the decision on the, the back end, whether we want to Yeah, I, I think we dropped some. Yeah. I, I mean, like Neo4j is not even fully baked. Uh, maybe we keep our Rango around for a little bit. But I think Neo4j and whatever else, I think we just dropped, like we just delete them. Yeah. Uh, there's no point of keeping them around because they're all half baked, anyways. It, yeah. I, 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 oh, I was going to say, I mean, I think we just need to come year. out very very clearly that like we're not supporting these we're we're getting rid of them blah 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 because i think that has led to confusion yeah. um uh even if we've made explicit like <laughs> hey some of these are not fully formed it's like you know i think when we obviously when we first started the project or even several months in there were a bunch of folks saying like oh i want to use neo4j or i want to use this other thing yeah yeah um i think also around the uh uh, I think some of it might also eventually sort itself out with uh, Cypher becoming part of or Cypher support coming to Postgres in the upcoming months anyway, right? Where some of the things that folks might have wanted to have might just be something that is baked into Postgres and, you know, yada, yada. 
Um, mm-hmm. I think we, it, I think either way though, I think folks need to, to, to understand like the reason why they're not there is because they're not, you know, we don't have the resources to, to manage this. Like I would have no problem if some, at some point in the future, some company, let's say Guidewire says, Hey, we're going to add a Rango support. And we put in all the effort to add a Rango support. And we're going to be the community maintainers of a Rango support. And it, you know, great. You know, but until then, I, I think it's just like, yeah, we don't have, sorry. I mean, for what it's worth, I think they did say that. <laughs> like they started, yeah, but they haven't. Like, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, do yeah. the whole Rango backup and we'll do it for you yeah. guys. Um, yeah, but, you know, yeah. again, like, where's the PRs, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, oh, yes. And then, yeah, I think building off what Mike is saying, I think Alistair mentioned this. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned it to the group, but yeah, Postgres is building in support for graph, like, Graph queries and all that kind of stuff directly into uh, into Postgres, and so we may not need and like full on kind of going forward. We can just switch to Postgres directly, which is probably going to be much more you know uh, efficient. I mean, I mean, it'll require some changes, of course, right? But it, you know, we're, we kind of move away from it, you know, and some of the problems and complexities that it may bring, and go straight to Postgres directly. So that might be one of the, the things we do in the future. I I want to go even further and say that I I feel like the I think even if a company came and said that you know we're gonna build this entire Arango support for for backend, I'm almost inclined to say like no I I don't think so like at least in my mind until we figure out all the all the uh, Kind of user journeys and the the value from I I think having one that one backend seems high overhead. Um. What, why I guess the question is like why why are we keeping the Rango backend a bit longer? Is that? Glad we're still on it. They're still migrating. Are they on the older version? Right? Are they upgrading their version? Oh, that's true. I guess we could remove it for newer releases. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's just get rid of it then. Or uh, I think we, we probably still want to at least like announce it in the community meeting before we before yeah. Okay, um, but I'm assuming so. The key values I I wanna so I'm guessing the key value soft stuff will be just purely like we don't want people to actively use it. Also, we want to say like that's testing only. Um, Uh, all right, before we end, I know Jeff, I think you posted that issue. Uh, it might be worth a good one to just chat through quick if we get to, yeah, we got some time. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> issue here is like for in SPDX, for example, um, in an SBOM, any license information has to be an ID on the SPDX license list or um, if it's not on, if the license isn't on the license list, you have to provide a randomized identifier and then reference a separate node in the SBOM that the, contains the license text. So it'll be like license ref one, two, three, and then the separate node will be like the actual text of the license. So that can cover any license that's not on the list. Um, so in Guac, we kind of mirror that. Um, so if it's an SPDX, uh, if it's on the list, you just, we create a license node that, um, contains that identifier. Uh, and then if it isn't, we actually create a guac GUID, uh, for a hash of the text. And then we, we store the text in the graph as a node. Uh, and then any certified license connects, of course, um, a package or source with those license nodes, a node or nodes. Um, the problem is uh, in the CDX parser, we kind of assumed the same thing, but that's not actually the spec. So the CDX spec says that you can provide an ID, an actual SPDX ID, or just a name. And if you provide a name, you can provide the text, but the text is not required. So some CDX SBOM generators are putting names instead of IDs. 
they might even be like real licenses that they're the 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 generator just sucks uh but but um or it could be an actual custom license where it's like bob's license but they just put the name bob's license um and so the question is what should we do in the graph for that um the quickest thing to do right now is just to ignore it uh and not create nodes um because kind of creating nodes in the graph is something that somebody has guac they're getting kind of getting forever <laughs> because uh, we don't go around and delete notes. Um, so I kind of think we should ignore it, although um, I'll let uh, Ben, you had, had some thoughts there. Yeah, I just, you know, for me, it's a matter of, you know, the number, uh, SPDX is not a complete data set. The number of li you know, licenses always, you know, come into being and projects are not necessarily good at representing them well anyway, which is why this bug exists in the first place. Um, so I, my tendency is to lean towards, well, let's take what we have and then present that to the user and let them figure out what that means to them, um, which I think is kind of, you know, our approach generally of like, we're not going to interpret the information for you. Here's the information to help you make the decision. Um, you know, your, I think Jeff, your point about, well, we don't actually delete nodes. So if we ingest this, it's a node forever. Um, that is you know, that's, that's a fair point. So, you know, maybe we do just ignore it for now. And at some point in the future, we find a, a way to handle it. I'm not sure, you know, what might change in the future that would make it easier to handle necessarily, but. Um, so I think, so, and, and I want to be clear, like ignoring it means like, don't create a license node, but keep the license expression. So if you were to get the certified license for that package, the license expression for declared would be Bob's license, uh, straight from the SBOM. And that's actually the full information from the SBOM. Like we're not, <laughs> there's no okay. text, so we don't know what Bob's license is. Uh, clearly like for licenses that are not on SPDX and where they're properly represented in the SBOM generator, like we're going to store that with the text of the license. Um, but I just don't, I think creating the license node, uh, with no more information other than a single string of the name of the license, um, is not helpful to the user's guac, um, and then we aren't we aren't actually losing that information because we're saving it in the certify legal node as the expression, including the string that was provided. Okay, I didn't quite understand the what ignoring it meant. So that makes a lot more sense. The only thing I can think of is like, and this is maybe too much of an edge case to worry about. Is like you know what if there are several packages in a thing that all use Bob's license. And then, you know, yeah, so that would actually goes through be, and says Bob's license be is terrible. Thing. Right. Yeah. That would be a thing that we wouldn't be able to provide it with just ignoring it. Like we wouldn't be able to have that single node that's connected to all the other nodes. It would be a, uh, uh, it would just be the strings in each one because we don't, because when somebody says Bob's license, like two different people can say Bob's license, but they could mean two different licenses because there's two Bob's. Right. And that's yeah. the whole reason why, like, we have to have the text. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like how many variations of MIT are there or BSD, you know, like 15,000 of them, but yeah. I, I, I guess this, this is almost like the, the same issue we have with follows, right? It's like it's the file name, but like we can kind of just, <laughs> yeah. I need to buy it. If we don't, um, if we do not create those nodes, um, we could add an endpoint to the REST API to recreate some of that uh, query functionality. It would be slow. Yeah, I mean, I think a search, search, like some, yes. The REST API is perfect for things like searches and filtering, and that does, you know, doesn't make sense with a single query, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so I think the consensus is like, not create the node, but included it as the expression, license expression string. Okay. 
Yeah. And look, where where do we document like things like this? Because that seems seems like important for somebody querying. Yeah, that's a good question. Like we've got a pretty decent explanation on the graph, like GraphQL schema itself in the comments, but that's like somebody that's exploring, or looking at the document GraphQL documentation or schema documentation. Um, we don't have any demos on license at all, I don't believe. So we will soon. <laughs> cool. Uh, I believe. Nathan was working on REST API stuff for license. Yeah, like get the license list. So maybe maybe we need to start a REST API section of the docs for all the fields, all the different REST API endpoints. We can talk about it there, but. I think Marco does bring out a good point of like, I think there, there are a couple of the data quality issues that, that maybe is like, uh, people will use the data and be like, wait, something is wrong and then they should. Probably just like look at this one place. Um, I was using SIFT and it was an interesting thing. And we didn't, you know, um, previous versions of SIFT, like we don't support anything like that. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense to document it in the GraphQL documentation um, and make the rest of endpoints such that people don't have to know about these things. Uh, I had a note and uh, um, uh, all right, we are past your day, so we'll find the hall this day. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.